morning, everyone. My name is Steven Sorkin. I'm the VP of Engineering at Splunk. And with me today, I have Eddie Satterley, who's the Chief Big Data Evangelist at Splunk. He actually just joined that role this week. He was previously at Expedia, where he was working on big data solutions for them. I have a couple of questions before we start with the slides. How many of you in this audience have heard of Splunk before? So a good number. And how many of you have used Splunk? Smaller number, looks like maybe 20%. How many of you are developers? Most of you are developers, data scientists? Terrific. Well, this is a Hadoop conference, and the Hadoop world is all about big data. So let's take a few slides to understand where we're coming from in talking about big data. One of the definitions of big data that I like, it comes from the AMP Lab at Berkeley, where they define big data as the set of problems that current technology doesn't solve well, either because it's too expensive, too slow, or not high enough quality. Another way to look at big data is these four Vs that characterize the data itself. Uh, a lot of people think about the volume and the velocity of data, that is, how much data you have under management and how fast it's arriving. But for Splunk, a really interesting question is the variety and variability of, of the data. So how many different types of data do you have under management at any one time? And how often does that uh, data that's coming into the system change its form? So machine-generated data is one of the fastest growing, most complex sets of big data. And when we look at the timeline of big data, uh, people started talking about it a few years ago, maybe four or five years ago. And this is really coincidental with the expansion of large systems. So you have your cell phones, your iPhones that are constantly talking to servers. And every time your iPhone is talking to a server at Apple, at the app manufacturer, at the uh, the phone carrier, a little bit of data is recorded on the system. This is machine-generated data. And it, people have always cared about looking at data, but now they have a vast set of data that provides an, a very interesting record of everything that happens in computer systems. So let's take a look at what machine-generated data looks like. Here are some simple examples. The first one is from an order processing system. The second is from a Java application server. The third is from a uh, IVR, uh, so a telephone system. And the last one is Twitter. These are all examples of machine-generated data that get recorded every time a person uses a device. They use a browser. They use a telephone. They enter a building that has a card key access system. They tweet. They send or receive an email. But the interesting thing about this data is that it contains critical insights into what is happening in the system. So when we go to the previous slide, it just looks like a mess of text. And often, for this type of data, you're not going to spend the time or effort to come up with a complicated ETL procedure to normalize it into a relational database. And this is because of those last two Vs in the four AVs of big data. There's too many types of data, and it changes too often for that ETL procedure to be very stable. So here we see an example of a customer ID that is shared amongst all of these records. You have the customer ID in the order processing system. You have the customer ID in the middleware system. You have a customer ID that's recorded by the IVR telephone system. And by tying this, the data together using uh, the critical uh, pieces of insight that you have that, that tie the data together, you can derive significant value. So now let's take a, a look at this from a different angle. What are the technologies that people have used to solve big data-driven problems? So decades ago, the standard technology was relational databases, and there is still an important place for relational databases in the world. Relational databases are ideal for OLTP systems that have to process transactions at a high rate of speed. And they can scale fairly well there. Over the past, say, decade, there have been 
uh, systems that are either SQL based or NoSQL based that, that uh, exploit massive clusters of machines. So on the SQL side, you have Aster and Greenplum. On the NoSQL side, you have technologies like Cassandra, Voldemort, Bigtable, CouchDB, MongoDB. And of course, you have Hadoop, which is a standard file system and job running engine for these systems. We've introduced Splunk as a way to bring in temporal, unstructured, heterogeneous data uh, into a single place to make it easy to retrieve. So how do we do this? The first step is collecting the data. Splunk makes it easy to collect data from throughout the enterprise in real time, low latency, and reliably. So Splunk has a forwarder that can be installed on any server throughout the enterprise that collects data as it is written by applications. This data is brought into a central location, and typically we index it into our own storage system. From this uh, data and from this index, we are able to provide ad hoc search. We can monitor and alert, report and analyze, build dashboards, and allow developers to extend the system. We can also take the data that is in Splunk and bring it to the other storage systems that you may have in your enterprise. For example, we have several financial customers that are using Splunk to collect data from all of their application servers, say for security use cases, compliance use cases. And on a regular basis, they bring that data that's stored in Splunk's indexes over to their Hadoop environments for longer term batch analytics. Other customers are taking the data that is in Splunk, summarizing it, and using it to drive reporting in their enterprise data warehouse systems. So we're able to collect and index any type of machine data. This is a fairly important distinction between Splunk and uh, other traditional storage technologies. We believe strongly that a system isn't going to work if it requires an upfront schema, especially for machine-generated data. If you have to build a connector that structures the data upfront, then the system is going to be brittle. The next time a developer changes a log line in the system, the next time a new system is brought online, or an external piece of software is upgraded, invariably one of those log lines is wrong. And, does, and e at worst, breaks the parser for all data, and at best, just doesn't parse that single type of line. We don't store our data in a relational database. It is, uh, again, a, a bit of a brittle way to store data in the system. And we can collect data from many, many different sources. We can collect data from systems like Windows, Linux, other Unixes. So for example, monitor the registry, monitor configurations, watch files in the file system. We can collect data from your virtualized environments, from your hypervisor and guest OS logs. We can collect data from applications. We can pull databases and index rows of data that are in databases. We can monitor networks. So let's wrap this up. We have a universal indexing system where we don't require data normalization. We try our best to handle timestamps, so Splunk is a time-oriented system. We don't require parsers. What we do at index time to bring data into the system is two things. We have to subdivide the stream of data into events, into discrete events, and we have to extract timestamps. We do nothing more. Now, you might ask, how can you provide analytics on this data? We apply structure to the data only at retrieval time. So only when you decide that you are running a search do we try to extract the fields from the data. You run a search, we have configured extractions, or you use our search language to specify how you want to manipulate your data. The next search that you run could operate on different configurations to extract fields. This means that there's no brittle schema, and you can provide different views onto the same data. For example, a security analyst is often going to look at different aspects of the data than a product manager who is looking at the data to understand how their product is being used. 
and we allow you to visualize this in our web-based user interface. As a result, it's fairly easy to deploy Splunk hours or days rather than weeks or months. So here's a little eye chart that shows some of our search language. So our search language is the main way to interact with data in the system. It's very simple. On, at the, the simplest end, it looks like a Google search. If you want to find events that have the word happiness, all you type in our search box is the word happiness. If you want to find the phrase true love, you just wrap it with quotes. But you can do a whole lot more. You can take the data, easily graph it over time. So this middle example of a zombie infestation trend, I'm not sure who came up with that one, takes data from one source and finds the distinct count of IDs over time. So putting this together, you can satisfy IT and operations users and application management users with ad hoc querying ability on the system, whether or not they're looking at data that has been in the system for seconds, minutes, hours, or days, or data as it's flowing into the system. You can build dashboards for security and compliance users, dashboards that look at customer trends for business analytics and web intelligence. The way that we scale is horizontally on commodity servers. So at the bottom tier, you have Splunk forwarders, which collect data from any machine or server or network device in your environment. The data is load balanced evenly on a tier of what we call Splunk indexers, which collect the data, store the data, and make it available for retrieval. Your users log into what are called search heads. This is the node that farms out the query to each of the indexers in the environment. So Splunk is a big data product. It's easy to download and deploy. It has end-to-end -end functionality and enterprise-grade features. It's end-to-end -end integrated. We collect data, we store data, we retrieve data, we visualize data, and we build dashboards for you to share. And we have customers that do this at the petabyte scale. So let's take a look at some specific examples of customers who are using Splunk to solve their data-driven problems in real time. So I think that everyone here should know about Zynga, which is the leading social gaming company in the United States. They've been a Splunk customer now for a couple of years. They're also a Vertica customer for, uh, for their large-scale batch analytics. Their Splunk use case is to collect web access logs, error logs, system level logs from every server throughout their entire infrastructure. One of their main use cases in Splunk is to understand very quickly whether a game is working or not working. So Zynga is well known for releasing their games on a nightly basis. So Splunk monitors their log files, their error logs, their web access logs in real time and makes it available to their analysts and to scheduled searches and to API users to look at the data. When they release a game every night, they look at the analytics that Splunk provides to determine whether that software deployment was successful or not. Everyone here should also know about Groupon. They're a, one of the leading providers of daily deals. Groupon also uses Splunk to guarantee API performance, to monitor API usage, and to provide analytics for key business metrics. For example, they look at conver conversion rates and funnel analysis on their daily deals in real time as the data flows into the system. This allows them to react quickly when something goes wrong in a daily deal push. All of the log data is available in Splunk, their operations staff, build Splunk dashboards, and our guarantee to them is that the data will be searchable within seconds of the time that their applications write to disk. Here's a picture of some of the dashboards that Groupon has running based on Splunk in their offices. And so Splunk helps Groupon integrate with Hadoop. They've chosen Splunk to collect data from all of their servers, 
index their data, provide real-time analytics on the data. But Splunk also runs regularly scheduled searches to push all of the data into HDFS, their system of record. So Hadoop serves their data scientists and their developers to build more sophisticated analytics on the data that run over days, weeks, and months of data. I'm now going to introduce Eddie Satterley to talk about some of his time at Expedia and what he has learned about big data there. Thank you. So formerly, I was uh, running uh, architecture and engineering at Expedia. Uh, for people who don't know what Expedia is, that would be surprising. But um, it's the world's largest travel site. There's about 90 different localized sites. There's a little over 4,000 total technology workers in the company and a development team of about 1,800. So in Expedia's environment, there are just over 12,000 servers, all of which have a Splunk forwarder running on them. There's 27,000 plus hosts, which includes appliances, network devices, everything else that are reporting in. 1,000 plus different source types, 20, 227,000 sources. The environment grew from initially eight indexers and four search heads to 38 indexers and 16 search heads. And at the last count was indexing a little over six and a half terabytes per day of uh, machine data. So why did Expedia go there? Uh, there was a, a, a bake off done, a few different products were evaluated, uh, uh, two business units were, got involved and the reasons that it was selected, this kind of shows in the circle, but the ability that the proof of concept was deployed in a day from a downloaded version of the software, we didn't have to have a vendor come in and do it. We were able to do it ourselves internally. Uh, we just spun up a couple of extra uh, boxes that were old legacy servers that were getting ready to get retired to be able to do the POC and scale it up that way. Um, we were able to pull in data immediately from the four different tiers of the one particular point of sale that we went after for the business unit. Uh, they, there were uh, both IT and business users eventually came to use it heavily out of the gate. There was uh, two people from the business side of the house that were looking at the data sets. Specifically, they were trying to do some work around SEO, SEM, as well as IT people who were doing daily and weekly releases for content and for actual code update. So the more of a DevOps perspective. And then the Splunk base apps that were available out of the box to do a lot of the things that needed to be done and the log types that were handled without us having to do custom parsing just directly out of the box. Then the next phase of the project, which we'll show you some timeline here in a second, but the big thing was the SDK integrations. Uh, we built a Cassandra data store, which was being used for a lot of uh, application logging and some uh, caching. We needed to pull that data in as well, so use the SDK to integrate that with Splunk to be able to pull that data and marry it to the data that already lived from the servers that was in Splunk and get a nice visualization of all that data put together. And then archiving data to Hadoop. So we have, or they now have a petabyte uh, Hadoop farm that's running uh, Cloudera and all of the data that needed to be done in batch analytics being exported, just like Stephen talked about from another customer, to Hadoop and being the batch analytics work is being done that way. So 10 months from kind of start to finish for the Splunk implementation at Expedia, it started off with a single business unit, 125 gigs a day, 1,100 systems, which was simply one web farm uh, and the tiers behind it. That started in January 2011. It was on all the e-commerce systems at 1.8 T per day by March, so within a three month time frame. By August, it was right at 4 T per day, 21,000 systems. And then starting this year, the big data integration piece has happened and it's handling about 90 T uh, per month of ingested data from various different sources from the app logs that's going into both Cassandra and Hadoop for different uh, pieces and Splunk is a visualization tool for both of them. So data types, like I said, Hadoop is kind of a two-way model, Cassandra as well, pulling in data from various sources all over the place, doing a ton of reference lookups. Um, there's a bunch of watch lists there from our previous incidents that had been seen. 
that you're using and correlating across all of this data together. So the, the big thing that for the ops perspective as well as the business users who are using the tool and literally at Expedia, everyone from the CEO down to uh, every dev, they all have accounts. It's used pretty regularly. There's about 1,400 concurrent users on a peak day, especially if there's any incidents going on or any releases. Uh, but the, the big trick is everything is temporal. So everything's based around time. When there's a big release going on, when content's being pushed, when any of this work is happening, you can very quickly narrow into the time range where there's a possible impact. You can identify it. You can figure out what systems are impacted, then bring in more data, either from Cassandra or from Hadoop or from a lookup table that's been built or whatever else it is, and be able to pull all that data into one single place and track down exactly what happened when. And even our automated release systems were being, so using Blade Logic to do a lot of code push, all of that information is also being logged and put into Splunk so it can all be correlated. So the Splunk impact, the first six months for uh, the implementation, the original ROI that was promised was uh, two and a half million. Uh, it hit 11 million uh, by the end of six months. By the time August rolled around, it was a little over 14. The ROI was basically on tools consolidation and retirement, which was a very small piece of it, the 83% MTTR reduction was the key piece. So when a release was done, there was a lot of times where farms were put back in rotation, people had a degraded experience, and you had customers reporting a problem. That ceased to happen when this uh, solution got put in place. The system usually was finding the problems as when the first servers were uh, deployed before they were ever put back in rotation. There was very few, or still are very few, outages that are reported by customers. So the outage avoidance was a huge piece of this. The Splunk usage is viral. That's an understatement when it comes to Expedia. Uh, there's actually 12 offshore developers plus four developers at Expedia who do nothing but build Splunk apps on a regular basis now. There's over 50 apps that were written within Expedia that are deployed. Uh, some of which are based on Splunk-based apps that were pulled down and customized to Expedia's use cases. Some of them were completely custom to exactly what Expedia needed. And like I said before, there's over 1,400 users that are on on a regular basis, especially around release windows and testing and integration timeframes and then peak season. So the, the continue adding of more data types and more data, pulling in stuff from Cassandra and Hadoop, Putting, being able to archive stuff into a dupe to let the analysts do their longer month over month, year over year kind of work has been really, really key. Uh, that, that really didn't hit the ROI numbers because that's all happened afterwards, but if you added that ROI to it, it's probably doubled again. So now for the fun part, Q&A. <laughs> so open up to questions for us here. Anyone have questions? Go ahead. So are you saying uh, a node completely disappears or if a node just becomes more loaded and, and so is like underperforming? Okay, so you're saying a machine failure. So, so the machine, oh. Okay, so, so the machine goes away from, from use. So, so uh, one, uh, one of the customers that I mentioned, Zynga, ran a very large Splunk cluster in EC2, so dozens and dozens of machines. And their architecture was based on using elastic block storage to move the data from one machine to another. So every Splunk indexer was, it was assigned one EBS volume. And if a machine went away, their automation that they built would reprovision that on a, a different uh, indexer. So they would reprovision. Uh, on the log port, uh, yes. So Splunk is running as a daemon, as an agent. It's our forwarder that's running, and it's trying to collect data as quickly as possible. So, so 
chances are when that machine goes away, if you're just using ephemeral storage on that, that the machine that you're collecting data from, if there is data loss, it's only gonna be a second or two of data loss. So our goal is to get the data off of the machine that's generating it as quickly as possible into the tier of Splunk indexers to store. Uh, and the reason that we do that is one, so that historical searches can look at that data very quickly. And the other reason is so that if you use a real-time search, which is the exact same syntax, we can apply it to the stream of data coming in. And uh, as an example, we've looked at very, very large streams of data, terabytes uh, of data a day, and we're able to uh, deliver a specific match against that data to the user within a couple of seconds after it was written to disk on the system that it's being monitored from. Mm -hmm. Question? Yes, certainly can. Uh, so it was, there's two parts of the integration. One is the applications were already writing a lot of the transaction data to Cassandra at that point anyway. So from that perspective, the data was already living in Cassandra for the app to use. So literally from the Cassandra write, writing an index file out, which the Splunk forwarder local on the Cassandra server is picking up and sending back into Splunk to be indexed, which was literally the primary and all the secondary indexes from Cassandra. Then via the SDK wrote a query, a special query language that would use CQL on the back end to use those keys, either the row key or any of the indexes to go retrieve the data sets out of, out of Cassandra and visualize it in the Splunk UI itself and marry that with the server data that was tied to that transaction via transaction IDs, which were GUIDs and tied directly back to machine data as well. The other use case was specifically for application logging where there were very large data blobs that were part of the logging, uh, which were in JSON. And it didn't make sense to have all of that data in Splunk because it wasn't necessary. Most of it is, has low value to the users in Splunk. It's uh, just occasional usage, so that data was piped in separately, written through the Splunk forwarder, again, all collected the same route, but then was forked so that the index data was written to Splunk and the entire payload plus the indexes were all written into Cassandra. Again, could be searched in the Splunk UI using the same query language, pointing it to a different uh, column family. So l let me uh, add to that just a little mm -hmm. bit. The typical way that uh, you connect Splunk to other systems is through our search language. So our search language is a pipeline of commands. It, it's inspired by the Unix shell, where you have the index at, often you have the index at the, the far left side and, and each command processes the data in some way. There are three types of commands that are interesting for this case. There's the commands that generate data from, an, from a foreign data set. So, in the case of the Cassandra integration, there's a search command that could run a CQL query and pull that data into Splunk on an ad hoc basis, say for the purpose of displaying in a dashboard. There are search commands that can act as lookups so to enrich your data. Uh, that's essentially doing a join of the data in the other set to data that's already in Splunk. You may do that against a high performance NoSQL key value store. You may do that against a traditional relational database. If it holds uh, the dimension information for your warehouse. And then finally, there are search commands that can write the data back to another set. And that's how we do most of our Hadoop integrations, is we have a search command that can take the data that is fetched from the Splunk index, pre-process it in whatever way, so filter it, extract fields, figure out where you're gonna write it in Hadoop, and then write it to HDFS. Yeah, go ahead. Right. So, so our indexing uses a very simple uh, tokenization algorithm. We look for what we call major and minor breakers. So essentially we look for punctuation. And we're going to index every 
consecutive characters between punctuation. So every consecutive alphanumeric character. And there are some punctuation symbols like the dot, which we will also uh, read over as well. So in the case of an IP address, 10.1.2.3, we're going to index 10, we're going to index 1, we're going to index 2, we're going to index 3, and we're going to keyword index 10.1.2.3, that whole sequence. There's, we have a video on our website, I believe, that, that goes through the exact detail of this. And it's, although we allow customers to configure it, usually they don't find it necessary to configure. And there's a question over here. Uh, for data in Splunk? Oh, absolutely. So we have a strong role-based access control system. Uh, most of our larger customers will use a foreign system, Active Directory, or another LDAP server for authentication and authorization. When a user logs into the system and is authenticated against that, uh, that uh, LDAP server, will establish what roles they belong to. And that's usually based on mapping from LDAP groups to Splunk roles. And then from a Splunk role, there are, there's a uh, set of capabilities that that role can uh, possess. That uh, role can also have access or not have access to certain indexes in the system. So the typical way of protecting data itself is to say, index A can be read by roles uh, X, Y, and Z. Index B can only be read by roles Y and Z. Index C can only be read by role Z. And that's how we uh, protect the data itself. We also have a set of objects in the system. For example, save searches and dashboards, which are also protected using access control lists that map roles to being able to read or write those objects. Yes? Absolutely. So, so the question is, uh, what are the suite of tools that exist in the Splunk community? Uh, so we have an app repository called Splunkbase, which is where our community shares these. And uh, these apps are essentially report packs on the data. That, that's one way to think of them. There are also ways to visualize the data. So an example would be there are many apps on the repository that deal with computer security. So. Uh, identifying problems in networks or servers that are indicative of security failures. There are also uh, apps that exist on Splunk Base that help you connect other data to the system. For example, you've brought in some data from a, uh, a, a specific type of network device, but you don't know how to understand the data itself. You can download an app from Splunk Base after the fact which provides the field extractions on that data. Yes? So, so the, the basis of Splunk search is keyword search and field equals value search. And you can uh, combine those elements using ands, ors, and nots, parentheses. And so at, at its simplest, you're just retrieving events. You're retrieving events from the index, either using keywords or using field equals value pairs that were extracted after the fact. After you retrieve that set of events, you can use our pipeline syntax to uh, pro further process the data. Right. So, so it's typically by configuration. So there are ways that you can configure the data to automatically extract fields. One is by, by specifying regexes. Another is by specifying delimiters in the data. If the data already looks like key equals value, our automatic key value extraction techniques will extract that key equals value pair. If the data is in a structured format like XML or JSON, we'll automatically extract the fields and allow you to refer to those fields. We, you can also configure lookups, where it takes an existing field and maps it to uh, another value for that field. So a, a concrete example for that would be status codes in web access logs. So 
200 means OK, and 404 means not found. And so if you want to create a field which is the status description, you can use a lookup table that maps those ordinals to the, to the phrases. So, so when you're using Splunks, in, so the question is, what is the data flow for, uh, for running analytic queries in the system? And so Splunk has a built-in MapReduce framework. Uh, we built our own because the company was started in, in 2004, and there, there wasn't existing a, a strong one like Hadoop. And furthermore, we had different goals. Specifically, we want to be able to run interactive queries where the response comes back quickly. We want to preview the uh, results of ongoing queries to give users a good interaction. And we want to apply these same queries to real-time streams of data. So when a query comes into the search head, the, the system that the user logs into, we take the search, we break it into a single map phase and a single reduce phase. We send that map phase to each of the indexers in the system to run whatever can be run in, in parallel. We take a, the reporting command. So for example, if you're computing a statistical aggregate, we'll find out what sufficient statistics we want that indexer to compute for us. And then we stream that data back over the wire to the search head over a HTTPS connection. So it's SSL for uh, privacy and security. And it's also gzip compressed to minimize data transfer. So we have customers that have tiers of indexers in a single physical location, in which case they don't necessarily care that much about the bandwidth. We also have large customers who have indexers spread throughout the world. And from a single location, you can run a query against all of the data wherever it's stored. And it typically, depending on the query, of course, depending on how much the, the, we actually have to send over the wire. We tried our hardest to send as little over the wire for answering the query. Question, yes? How do we rank search results? How do we rank results? Good question. Uh, we rank search results by time. So we don't have any other notion than time for ordering the events that, that you retrieve from a search. Uh, in machine data, time is king. Time is a first class concept in Splunk. Next question. So there was Lucene at the time that, uh, that Splunk came. The, one of the biggest reasons we didn't use Lucene uh, when, when we started building Splunk was the ability to index data as it flowed into the system as opposed to as a batch process. So typical uh, Solar and Lucene before it were built to handle uh, web type search use cases where there is a large phase of collecting data, a large phase of indexing data, and then you use this index over and over. On the other hand, for the types of queries that we have, we want the data to be searchable within seconds. Our initial customers were IT people solving operational problems using a Google-like interface on the data. Solar and Lucene do not have the time characteristics that we need to make this type of search efficient. Uh, if, you, if you index too small of a slice of data, uh, it, it's, it's difficult to get the, the batch characteristics. So that's the main reason why we, we didn't use Solar and Lucene. Is that like yeah. today? Uh, it has gotten better now. Uh, I think that there are still advantages to our index format and our structure of the indexes for providing the type of retrieval that we need. The, the core indexer is a slice of our technology. We would have to evaluate the, the, the specifics of it. But uh, it was worthwhile to build the indexer. And we believe that having the, the fine tuning, especially in IO characteristics, is pretty important in our system. Yeah, we're, okay. down, we're down to the last minute. We should probably defer the rest of the questions to the booth and just have you guys.